Merry Christmas, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is Louis Jordan bringing you greetings from Recording for the Blind, its many students, its many volunteer workers whose splendid efforts make its services possible. May I, on behalf of Recording for the Blind, thank all who have participated in this recording. Thanks also to the authors and publishers of these pieces who have generously given us permission for their use. It is now almost 2,000 years since St. Luke told the story of that first Christmas. Since then, it has been celebrated in song and story, in joy and reverence, in moods and attitudes, as varied as the ornaments on your gayest Christmas tree. We bring you some of the masterpieces of Christmas lore, spoken and sung by my friends and colleagues. First, the story of that first Christmas from the Gospel according to St. Luke, read for us by Miss Agnes Moorhead. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Another detail in the story of that first Christmas is added by St. Matthews, who wrote, When the wise men departed, lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. The star and the wise men have inspired many stories and suggested many charming episodes, one of which is told by Herwood Brown in his Frankincense and Myrrh, which we hear now in the voice of Mr. Yule Brenner. Once there were three kings in the east, and there were wise men. They read the heavens, and they saw a certain strange star by which they knew that in a distant land the king of the world was to be born. The star beckoned to them, and they made preparations for a long journey. From the palaces they gathered rich gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, Great sacks of precious stuffs were loaded on the backs of the camels, 
which were to bear them on their journey. Everything was in readiness, but one of the wise men seemed perplexed and would not come at once to join his two companions who were eager and impatient to be on their way in the direction indicated by the star. They were old, these two kings, and the other wise man was young. When they asked him, he could not tell why he waited. He knew that his treasures had been ransacked for rich gifts for the king of kings. It seemed that there was nothing more he could give, and yet he was not content. He made no answer to the old man who shouted to him that the time had come. The camels were impatient and swayed and snarled. The shadows across the desert grew longer, and still the young king sat and thought deeply. At length, he smiled, and he ordered his servants to open the great treasure sack upon the back of the first of his camels. Then he went into a high chamber to which he had not been since he was a child. He rummaged about and presently came out and approached the caravan. In his hand, he carried something which glinted in the sun. The kings thought that he carried some new gift more rare and precious than any which they had been able to find in all their treasure rooms. They bent down to see, and even the camel drivers peered from the backs of the great beasts to find out what it was which gleamed in the sun. They were curious about this last gift for which all of the caravan had waited. And the young king took a toy from his hand and placed it upon the sand. It was a dog of tin, painted white and speckled with black spots. Great patches of paint had worn away and left the metal clear, and that was why the toy shone in the sun as if it had been silver. The youngest of the wise men turned the key in the side of the little black and white dog and then stepped aside so that the kings and the camel drivers could see. The dog leaped high in the air and turned a somersault. He turned another and another and then fell over on his side and lay there with a set and painted grin upon his face. A child, the son of a camel driver, laughed and clapped his hands, but the kings were stern. They rebuked the youngest of the wise men, and he paid no attention, but called to his chief servant to make the first of all of the camels kneel. Then he picked up the toy of tin, and opening the treasure sack, placed his last gift with his own hands in the mouth of the sack so that it rested safely upon the soft bags of incense. What folly has seized you, cried the eldest of the wise men. Is this a gift to bear to the king of kings in the far country? And the young man answered and said, For the king of kings, they are gifts of great richness, gold and frankincense and myrrh. But this, he said, is for the child in Bethlehem. And we now come to Santa Claus. His most popular and beloved appearance is under his original name. It is Clement Moore's poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas. The title may sound somewhat strange to you. It is, in fact, the original title of the poem we all remember as The Night Before Christmas. We will hear this in a rare item of story and song, a performance by the Kingsmen Quartet of Ken Darby's musical setting of this beloved poem, accompanied by Billy Mills' orchestra, with Miriam Jordan as the little girl, Teeny. It was the night before Christmas and all through the house Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hope that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their wee little bed while visions of sugar plums danced in their wee Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled 
I'd like to read to you uh, an editorial that first appeared in the New York Sun, September 21st, 1897. 
67 years ago. It's titled, Is There a Santa Claus? Here it is. We take pleasure in answering at once, and thus prominently the communication below, expressing at the same time our great gratification that its faithful author is numbered among the Friends of the Sun. Dear Editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except what they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with a boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus? <laughs> you might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus, but even if they didn't see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not. But that's no proof that they're not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside. But there is a veil covering the unseen world, which not the strongest man or even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Only faith fancy, poetry, love, romance, can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world, there's nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. <laughs> Thank God he lives and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times, ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. Thank you, Edward G. Robinson, but I must tell you, regretfully, that there have been those who disagree. Uh, one doubter in particular has been somewhat immortalized, however undeservedly, by the magic of Ogden Nash. This is Mr. Nash's tale of a voluble and peculiarly zealous non-believer and the disastrous result of his insistent non-belief. We hear this dramatic tale in the voice of Danny Kay, who tells us the story in Ogden Nash's poem, The Boy Who Didn't Believe in Santa Claus. The Boy Who Laughed at Santa Claus by Ogden Nash. In Baltimore, there lived a boy, and he wasn't anybody's joy. 
Although his name was Jabez Dawes, his character was full of flaws. In school, he never led the classes. He hid old ladies' reading glasses. His mouth was open while he chewed, and elbows to the table glued. He stole the milk of hungry kittens and walked through doors marked no admittance. He said he acted thus because there wasn't any Santa Claus. Now, another trick that tickled J.B.'s was crying boo at little babies. He brushed his teeth, they said, in town sideways instead of up and down. Yet people pardoned every sin and viewed his antics with a grin till they were told by J.B.'s doors there isn't any Santa Claus. Deploring how he did behave, his parents quickly sought their grave they hurried through the portals pearly, and J.B.'s left the funeral early. Like whooping cough from child to child, he sped to spread the rumor wild. Sure as my name is J.B.'s Dawes, there isn't any Santa Claus. Slunk like a weasel or a marten through nursery and kindergarten, whispering low to every tot, there isn't any. No, there's not. No beard, no pipe, no scarlet clothes, no twinkling eyes, no cherry nose, no sleigh. And furthermore, by Jiminy, nobody coming down the chimney. The children wept all Christmas Eve, and J.B.'s chortled up his sleeve. No infant dared to hang up his stocking for fear of Jabez's ribald mocking. He sprawled on his untidy bed, fresh malice dancing in his head, when presently, with scalp a-tingling, Jabez heard a distant jingling. He heard the crunch of sleigh and hoof crisply alighting on the roof. What good to rise and bar the door? A shower of soot was on the floor. Jabez beheld... O oh, awe of oars, the fireplace full of Santa Claus. Then J.B.'s fell upon his knees with cries of don't and pretty please. He howled, I don't know where you read it. I swear some other fellow said it. J.B.'s replied, the angry saint, it isn't I. It's you that ain't. Although there is a Santa Claus, there isn't any J.B.'s doors. Said J.B.'s then with impudent vim, Oh, yes, there is, and I am him. Your language doesn't scare me, it doesn't. And suddenly he found he wasn't. From grinning feet to unkempt locks, J.B.'s became a jack-in-the-box, an ugly toy in Santa's sack mounting the flu on Santa's back. The neighbors heard his mournful squeal. They searched for him, but not with zeal. No trace was found of J.B.'s doors, which led to thunderous applause. And people drank a loving cup and went and hung their stockings up. All you who sneer at Santa Claus, beware the fate of J.B.'s doors. The saucy boy who told the saint off the child who got him licked his paint off. Strange and beautiful things have happened at Christmas, and one of the strangest and most beautiful is told in the story of The Little Guest by Marjorie Williams Bianco, told to us by Miss Dana Winter. Every year, at about Christmas time, the Holy Child came on a visit to the nuns. He came with his mother and St. Joseph, and the shepherds and all the pet animals, and they all stayed together in the little house that the nuns fixed up for them. The house stood on a table in the entry just outside the chapel. First there was a white cloth over the table with lace edges hanging down, and on this stood the house. It had only a roof and one wall at the back, so that you could see right inside it. Behind were the mountains that Sister Gertrude had made, of brown paper covered with sparkly snow, and there were evergreens all around, and ivy, and two little pine trees growing by themselves in pots. The holy child seemed to like his little house. He lay just inside it, smiling on a bed of straw with a little white shirt on. He didn't seem to mind about its only having one wall, or that the nuns hadn't thought about putting any furniture in it. 
He lay there and smiled with his arms stretched out. His mother and St. Joseph knelt, one on each side, and behind them knelt two angels. That made five people, and the little house wouldn't hold any more, so the shepherds had to stand outside as close as they could get, and near them stood the animals, the cow and the grey donkey, and the three white lambs, two lying down and one standing up. Twice a day, going to chapel and coming out, the file of little blue pinafored girls passed the table where the holy child lived. Fourteen heads, two by two, brown and yellow and mouse-colored under their thin starched veils, bobbing by sedately, with wrinkled, kindly Sister Elizabeth in her black robes walking behind. Going to and from chapel, there was no time to pause, because all the older girls walked behind, and one had to keep moving. One had only a glimpse in passing of the little house, with all the family gathered around it, bright and dazzling in the light of the wax candles. But every evening at Christmas time, instead of going up the two long straight flights of stairs to the landing just outside the dormitory, where the little girls usually said their prayers, Sister Elizabeth would take them the long way round, down the hall and up the back staircase and through a door by the linen room to the chapel entry. To Louisa, spending her first Christmas with the nuns, there was something very exciting in this detour. The back stairway was rather dark, the boards creaked underfoot, and it had a queer, cupboardy smell. There were shadowy corners in it, and the most shadowy place of all was just by the linen room door. Here you had to stand still and wait, and not make any noise, because this was the nun's part of the house, and next door to the chapel. You had to stand very quietly, while Sister Elizabeth's feet in their flat shoes came creak, creak along the passage, past all the little girls in turn, till she reached the door and turned the handle. And then, when the door swung open, there were the candles shining, and the Christmassy smell of evergreens and hot melting wax, and in the middle of all this sudden brightness was the little holy child on his straw bed. Kneeling on the hard boards that always made her shift and wriggle long before Sister Elizabeth's measured voice reached the last, Amen, Louisa had a good view of the little house and everything about it. It was as if one could walk right up between the pine trees, past the grey donkey and the lambs, straight into the little room where the holy child lay. It was all very beautiful. And yet, there was something about it that was not quite right. Privately, Louisa had her own opinion of how the nuns treated the holy child. The snow was lovely, and so were Sister Gertrude's mountains and the little pine trees, but something better could have been done about the house. There was no furniture, there were no curtains, and there wasn't even a rug. Now, it was true that the holy child stayed in bed, but he couldn't be very comfortable even there. It was made of straw, and it looked prickly, and the little holy child had only a small shirt on. There should certainly have been a pillow, and as long as the nuns sewed so well, they could have made sheets and a quilt, and a little blanket too. Louisa supposed that they just hadn't thought about it, which was funny, because they had known for days and days that the holy child was coming. It was no way to treat a guest, and the holy child was a guest. Sister Elizabeth had said so. Nuns, Louisa thought, were very curious people. It was unusually cold that Christmas. When you went out of doors, even for a moment, your toes pinched and the wind stung your face. Indoors, the little girls had to wear their sweaters going to chapel and along the corridors, and when they got up in the morning, their fingers were pink and stiff. Because the big register on the floor, for some reason or other, was not giving all the heat it should, Sister Elizabeth brought an oil heater and stood it on the dormitory floor, and the children dressed around that. Then came the frostiest day of all. Tucked in bed that evening, her toes drawn up under her nightgown to keep them from touching the chilly sheets, Louisa thought about the holy child. He must be terribly cold down there. The nuns evidently were doing nothing about it. They didn't even seem worried. They wouldn't mind if the holy child froze. The oil heater turned low, glowed like a red eye in the middle of the dormitory floor. From the other beds came occasional rustlings and small breathing sounds of sleep. Louisa tried to sleep too, but every time she shut her eyes she saw the holy child with only his little shirt on, lying there on the straw bed as she had seen him that evening. And presently she heard, far off and hollow, the three tolls of the gateway bell, 
and after what seemed a very long time, the slow, tired steps of Sister Anne, the portress, making her last round. She came along the lower corridor, up the stairway, carrying her lantern, and then Louisa could hear the clink as she set it down finally at the head of the dormitory stairs, where it would burn until morning. For a little while longer, Louisa lay still, the blanket dragged up to her chin. Then, very cautiously, she pushed back the covers, slid first one leg, then the other out of bed. It was chilly on the floor. Louisa felt for her slippers, pulled on her dressing gown, and edging her way past the other beds with their humped, sleeping mounds, she reached the doorway and the open landing. There were two stairways. One, where the lantern stood, was that which the children always used. The other, narrower and steeper, led down through the nuns' part of the house to the chapel entry. Little girls had no business here alone, especially at night. Holding her breath, Louisa began to creep down, praying that the boards would not creak. The first landing at the bottom was easy, one turned to the right. There was a big room to cross, lined with closets, then came a corridor, another little flight of steps, and then one reached the chapel entry. The entry door was closed. Louisa tugged at it. It didn't stir. She tugged again, and it gave suddenly with a creak that seemed to echo through the whole house. She was in the chapel entry. There were no candles burning. Everything was dim and mysterious. Only a faint, uncertain flicker came from the little red swinging lamp overhead, shining down on the pine trees, the tiny house, and the small waxen figure of the holy child. For a moment, in that dim, pinkish glow, Louisa stood uncertain, her heart beating very fast. Then she moved closer, nearer still, till her fingers touched the white tablecloth. Resolutely, she reached out her hand, snatched the holy child from his bed of straw, and thrusting him into the warm folds of her dressing gown, turned and ran. In the morning, Louisa woke early. She pushed her hand under her pillow where she had put the holy child to sleep the night before, wrapped up in a handkerchief to keep him warm. Something very awful had happened to the holy child. No one would have recognized him. His limbs had lost their shape, his face was flattened and stuck fast to the handkerchief. He was nothing but a horrible, messy lump of softened wax. It was a judgment. She had been a wicked little girl. Hastily, too conscience-stricken even for tears, she folded the handkerchief back over what had been the holy child. But somehow, through her misery, a sense of injustice struggled. She hadn't wanted to be wicked. She had wanted to be good. She had wanted to make the holy child warm and comfortable. She had thought he would understand, and he hadn't understood. He had melted. What could be done? She couldn't leave him there. She couldn't put him back into the chapel. Had there only been an earthquake then and there, if it could have buried her and the whole school and the holy child all together, so that nobody, nobody would have ever known what had happened. But earthquakes don't come like that. And the dressing bell was ringing. The ancient mariner with a dead albatross about his neck suffered nothing in comparison with Louisa that morning. He at least did not have to carry his burden secretly. He was not in terror that every moment someone would say, what is that lump inside your frock? Louisa seemed to hold herself rather queerly all morning. At recess she showed an inclination to sit alone and sniff. A young nun who was in charge of the children called her over. Why aren't you playing with the others, dear? I don't know. I think I've got a cold. Well, you shouldn't sniff like that. Where's your handkerchief? I haven't got one. Louisa flushed guiltily. It was a lie. She knew where her handkerchief was. Even as she said it, she could feel something slipping, slipping right down by her waistband. Oh, if only the elastic would hold. Then I think you'd better go and fetch one. Go quietly up and quietly back, and if you meet anyone on the stairs, you can say that Sister sent you. No sign from a relenting heaven could have been more welcome. Clutching her waistband, treading with every precaution until she was once outside the door, Louisa went. Once she reached the corridor, she flew, still gripping her garments tightly to her. All morning she had prayed for just this chance. When she reached the dormitory landing, she turned neither to left nor to right, but went straight on to the bathroom. Now, this particular bath had been put in when the school was remodeled. It was a high, old-fashioned tub, and underneath it, where the pipes went down, there was a piece of floorboard missing. 
Louisa knew this, for she had once lost a big glass bead down there. It had rolled under the bath, and she couldn't get it out. What she was going to do was wicked, but it couldn't make things any worse than they were already. She shook herself. Something fell with a little thud to the linoleum. She picked up the holy child, handkerchief and all, and lying down flat on her stomach, she poked him through the hole, in and as far under the floorboards as she could reach. She had done with taking care of him. She had done with trying to be kind to people ever again, as long as she lived. Four o'clock came. Two by two, the little girls went into the chapel. As they passed the holy child's house with the candles blazing before it, Louisa never turned her head. Invisible strings were pulling her, but she dared not look. Nothing had been said all day. Perhaps in chapel they were going to speak about it. Perhaps when they all stood up to go out, someone would step out into the aisle. But still nothing happened. The little girls rose, filed one by one out of the straight pews, and joined their ranks, just as usual. Louisa looked straight ahead. She crossed the mat by the chapel door. Now she could smell the evergreens and the hot wax. The warm breath from the candles was right in her face. She had to turn. There was the little house, just as usual. There were Sister Gertrude's mountains, all shiny, and the pine trees, and the shepherds, and the grey donkey. And there, just where he had always been, was the holy child. He seemed to have grown a little, that was all. The candlelight shone on his yellow, tight little curls, and his waxen arms stretched out. He smiled at Louisa, as if nothing had happened at all. Now our Christmas visit is over. But before leaving you, may I give your thanks, as well as ours, to all those whose talents as writers and interpreters have given us this enjoyable half hour. And may I close with two short verses which I sincerely believe express the hope and wish of a soul at this holy and happy time. Its author is unknown, but the meaning of his words is ageless and universal. O oh, gathering clouds and wintry earth, the manger of our Savior's birth, though minds are dulled by toil and time, the bells peal out their ageless chime. Bring joy, bring joy, bring joy, O oh God, to all this Christmas tide. O oh, gathering clouds that shroud our land, thy people need thy guiding hand. Dispel the gloom, bring thoughts to life of higher things than endless strife. Bring peace, bring peace, bring peace, O oh Lord, to all this Christmas tide.